so last time we introduced the idea of a tautological control system. Um, uh, and I want to start by wrapping up some loose ends from uh, the class uh, last time. Um, uh, so there's three things that I um, will wrap up with. Um, one, uh, um, so, so a lot of the things that I, I said last time were a tiny bit rambling, and the, the reason they were rambling is because I was you know, trying to kind of force fit the, a differential inclusion framework uh, in, and, and the, the point kind of was that it doesn't fit. Um, um, and, uh, and so there were lots of kind of partial conclusions there, and, and I guess the summary from all of that is that there is simply no nice correspondence between uh, differential inclusions and either ordinary control theory or uh, control theory in the tautological framework. There's certain problems with the correspondence that are rectified by the tautological framework, but there's others that are not. Okay, so, so um, um, differential inclusions, and you know, so, so what I said last time is differential inclusions are just too floppy and structureless uh, uh, to correspond to very structured entities like control systems or tautological control systems. Um, and so, from my point of view, uh, differential inclusions are not very interesting. And in fact, they're, I would only say. The, a differential inclusion for me, so remember I had denoted a differential inclusion by um, a set valued map like this. Um, and then corresponding to a differential inclusion, uh, you had uh, a tautological control system. Okay? Um, and this was uh, uh, Remember, a tautological control system consists of uh, a manifold M and a, uh, a pre-sheaf of sets of vector fields, uh, F, and, and, um, and the vector fields for this pre-sheaf over the open set U um, uh, was this thing that I denoted, um, and so we have our degree of uh, regularity uh, nu. Um, and so these are vector fields uh, on U, <coughs> Which at every point take values in the uh, differential inclusion x. Okay. All right. So this is uh, we go from a, uh, a differential inclusion to a tautological control system, and then of course uh, you can very easily go from uh, tautological control systems to differential inclusions, and so we have that construction. Okay. And I and I and so generally speaking, um, uh, you have uh, this inclusion. And definitely nothing more than that. Okay, so you know, for example, uh, this thing. Um, sorry, um, yeah, this thing, um, and you know, particularly this thing uh, could be empty. Okay, <clears throat> um, and so what I would say is that I would say a, a differential inclusion. So differential inclusion is the problem with them in some sense. Uh, is that they don't have a very natural way of defining regularity. And the kinds of regularity that you talk about with differential inclusions, these kinds of uh, assumptions about semi-continuity and, and things like this, uh, they definitely do not uh, guarantee um, uh, anything interesting about this kind of a construction. And so I would say that a differential inclusion, uh, X, is of class uh, C nu if um, this relationship holds. <clears throat> okay. So that gives you a way of uh, assigning some regularity uh, to a differential inclusion by talking about the uh, 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 vector fields that take values in the differential inclusion. Um, and the whole point is that if you're talking about a differential inclusion with this property, um, you could just as well be talking about that. Okay, so so um, uh, differential inclusions with lots of regularity in this sense. Uh, uh, so this is a definition, by the way. <clears throat> okay, uh, differential inclusions with lots of regularity in this sense. You can just as well deal with the, the vector fields. Okay, and, and probably you want to because the vector fields have associated with them things like flows, whereas differential inclusions uh, you have just trajectories, which are not necessarily embedded as integral curves of any kind of vector field. Okay. All right, so that was one little piece of wrap-up that I wanted to make. <coughs> um, 
Uh, the other was, um, remember we had defined um, a certain kind of differential inclusion, uh, which was uh, that corresponding to a, uh, a distribution uh, of class C nu. And the, the, death, the class C newness of a distribution, um, remember how that was defined. That was defined by saying about every point in M, there was a neighborhood of that point in M, uh, and a bunch of, you know, some, some number, definitely not finite, possibly infinite, but a bunch of uh, C new vector fields, so that the distribution at every point uh, in that neighborhood was the span of uh, those vector fields evaluated at that point. Okay, so that was our definition of a distribution of class C nu. Um, and then corresponding to this, uh, we had this pre-sheaf, uh, which I called uh, FD, and of course, this is defined in rather the same way as, uh, as this guy. Um, so it's the vector fields uh, U, so that uh, their values The distribution at every point. <clears throat> okay, um, and so I, uh, uh, because this FD sort of corresponds to a differential inclusion, um, uh, this guy will be a sheaf. Okay, uh, and therefore it will never be globally generated, or you know, virtually never. Um, uh, and um, but. Um, Unlike the differential inclusion case, which is kind of too general to, to be able to really say anything interesting about whether um, uh, whether this uh, whether this uh, sheaf is globally generated, here because there's some algebraic structure, okay, associated with the fact that, that uh, this is a subspace at every point, okay, uh, you can actually make some conclusions about the. Uh, well, it will not be globally generated, but there will be some statement about global generation here, and the statement is this. Um, so if uh, uh, new is um, <laughs> okay the, of the of one of that, those regularity classes, and so the only thing that's missing from that list uh, is the holomorphic case. Okay, so the statement I'm about to make is not generally true in the holomorphic case. Okay, so if I have a distribution with this kind of regularity, then what's true is that uh, FD is uh, the sheafification of the uh, uh, um, globally generated Associated. Okay, so a globally generated pre sheaf, remember, is one whose vector fields uh, on the neighborhood U are just restrictions of globally defined vector fields. And so, okay, so the set of globally defined vector fields here is, of course, just uh, the set of all vector fields on the manifold taking values in the distribution. Okay, so this is a thing <coughs> that is often studied, okay, if you talk about a distribution, very often you talk about the set of vector fields taking values in the distribution, okay? It's a slightly different thing than FD, okay? Um, because FD is, is, is a pre-sheaf, in fact a sheaf, and that's a set of vector fields, okay? Um, but nonetheless, uh, this guy is the sheafification of that one. And uh, let me just say a few words about that because it's, it's interesting. Um, so in these cases, uh, that uh, assertion is proved by using, in a relatively elementary way, uh, partitions of unity. Okay. Um, in this case, okay, the statement becomes non-trivial. Okay, and what you have to do. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of say the words. If you're interested, you can go out there and dig all this stuff up. Um, so, in the real analytic case, um, this uh, pre-sheaf, and well, sheaf in fact, uh, you can show is locally finitely generated. And what does that mean? That means that around every point, 
there uh, is a neighborhood and a finite set of vector fields defined on that uh, neighborhood which uh, generate the stocks of the pre-sheaf uh, at that point. And when I say generate here, um, what I mean is generate uh, as a uh, module over the ring of functions, not in the um, vector space case sense, but in the, in the module sense. Okay? So you can show, non-trivially by the way, that this guy is uh, locally finitely generated in that sense. Um, and then uh, from that it's relatively easy to show that this uh, sheaf has this property of coherence. Okay, so what's coherent? Well, coherent has two attributes. One is that it's locally finitely generated, so I just said that. Um, the other is essentially that if you take algebraic equations with values in um, this sheaf, okay, so uh, uh, the, the values are uh, sections uh, of D, okay, um, so you take a finite, any finite collection of, of, of uh, algebraic equations with values in D, the null space of, of those equations will itself be a, uh, a, finitely gener a locally finitely generated sheaf. Okay? So that's the property of coherence. Okay? So in other words, with my definition of uh, a, a, a real analytic distribution, this sheaf is coherent. Okay? Then, uh, basically, my statement here follows from what's known as uh, uh, Cartan's Theorem A. And Cartan's Theorem A says that the, in this case, it says that the, um, that this stock for every x, okay, this is a stock, and so again, I'm going to think of this as being a stock in a particular category here. The category will be uh, the category of modules over rings of functions. Okay, so uh, that stock is generated by global sections. Okay, so that's Cartan's theorem B, <coughs> which is again a non-trivial theorem. Okay, <coughs> so in the real analytic case, this statement is a, a bit of a deep one. Okay, and just to give you a little bit more intuition about how deep that is, in the holomorphic case, this statement is generally false. It's true if M is a, a, a Stein manifold. Okay, again, again, you need this. Um, business about Stein uh, for things to work in the whole market case. And so, for example, um, uh, 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 you'll uh, be able to find um, distributions on compact holomorphic manifolds um, uh, for which uh, this guy um, uh, is not the sheafification of something that's globally defined. Okay, and that's because you know, globally defined things generally in the holomorphic case are simply too small um, uh, for them to give rise to anything useful locally. And in the real analytic case, that's thanks to Grower. Uh, um, not just Grower. Yeah, you have to agree with Grower. So the history here is this. It is Cartan's theorem B was proved by Henri Cartan in 1957 before Grower's theorem. And so uh, in his theorem, he made an assumption um, well, actually, uh, so his uh, um, his theorem was about Euclidean space, and so you know, in in, in the statement of his proof, the, the M was Euclidean space, um, and he said in the paper that you know, if we could analytically embed a manifold, then you could use his result to prove the result on manifolds, and so, um, but but you know, even the Euclidean space case um, is non-trivial. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so it's Grower plus more. Okay, um, and so the other, so I'm, I'm wrapping things up that I didn't get around to saying last time. Um, and so the other thing I was gonna say was a question that Abdul Reza asked. And so remember that a topological control system, um, this is a very important point, so I, I want to make it. <clears throat> so a topological control system, remember, is two things. It's a manifold and a pre-sheaf of sets of vector fields. And so Abdul Reza asked the question, it's, it's a, uh, a, a salient question. Um, is there any algebraic structure uh, on that pre-sheaf? And, and my answer is no, uh, none whatsoever. And the reason is this, um, that you know, if you have a actual control system, <clears throat> like that, right? Then um, what's the, um, what's the pre-sheaf F corresponding to that? Well, it was, um, Um, okay. Sorry about the proliferation of U's. Okay. 
It's simply, uh, you take the set of all vector fields, uh, which you obtain from your uh, uh, system, which, you know, whose governing equations look like this. Uh, so you fix the value of uh, uh, u, and you take the vector field corresponding to that, that's fu, and you restrict those things to the open set u, uh, and that's what the pre-sheaf is. Um, so generally speaking, for a system like this, right, the control set here, um, uh, There'll be, there'll be nothing interesting algebraically about this uh, set of vector fields. You know, it won't be a subspace because the control set C is probably uh, going to be bounded in some way. Okay? The control set C, for example, could consist of a discrete number of points. All right? <clears throat> so you want to uh, allow for those possibilities, and that completely eliminates um, uh, any algebraic structure on this, on this pre-sheaf app. Okay? Um, and I would, the, so very often in geometric, you know, uh, geometric treatments of control theory, and by that I mean uh, 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 a differential geometer makes a foray into control theory to, to do some stuff. Very often they'll impose some algebraic structure there, and it's really, um, you have to be very, very careful uh, that you're um, still dealing with questions of interest when you do that, okay? Because control systems will not have this algebraic structure. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what we're going to do, uh, that, that finishes the wrap-up from last time. And we're going to now talk about trajectories, okay? Um, so trajectories, of course, for topological control systems, and of course we have trajectories for control systems, and, and then, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, there's one more thing that I want to say before I, I do that. Um, and this also was, was the question that Gloriza asked, and that is, we had um, given a control system, okay, we had a way of constructing from this control system, in this way right here, um, a, a tautological control system. Okay. <clears throat> then, given a tautological control system, okay, and so this uh, tautological control system here will be globally uh, uh, globally generated, obviously, because each of these vector fields fu is uh, globally defined. <clears throat> okay, then given a globally generated tautological control system, we had a way of defining um, a control system, and you remember that the control system had as its control set just the set of um, uh, vector fields for your system. Okay, so the set of vector field, the fields defined on all of them. Okay. All right, so given a um, so this was the control set for um, okay, and so the question is, uh, sorry, that's not an equal sign. That's a, I want to deal with one of those. Okay, so then the question is, um, what's the relationship between those? Okay, <clears throat> well, um, uh, they will. Okay, so you end up back where you started. Um, okay, so there's a condition, and this condition is almost certainly not an if and only if, although I don't have examples to, to show that. Um, um, uh, okay. All right, so we have a control system sigma now. So we have uh, this map, which takes a control u in the uh, topological space C um, into fu in the space of vector fields. Okay, so there's a map from uh, that topological space to that topological space. <clears throat> okay, and this should be, um, if it's an injective, uh, in fact, I, I don't need even that. So it's a homeomorphism onto its image. Okay, so what we know by our definition of control system is that the map is continuous. Okay, so there's two additional things that I'm asking here. One, um, uh, that it should be injective. Okay, so let me talk about that. So that means that the map from U 
to this vector field should be injective. That's not a big assumption. Okay. This, but just to make perfectly clear, this is not saying that this map, okay, All right. So now I'm fixing an X, okay, um, and I'm talking about the map which goes from control space into tangent vector, okay, not vector field, tangent vector. This is not saying that that map has to be injective for every X or necessarily even for any x. It's not saying that at all, okay? It's a very different thing. It's saying that this map has to be injective, okay? Now, if it's not injective, <clears throat> then what this really means is that your control set is too big, okay? Because that means that you have controls, um, which, um, well, you have two different controls, which are doing exactly the same thing for your dynamics, okay? Um, so, it's a, and there's probably a process that you can undergo. You can certainly do this in special cases, but even in general, there's probably a process that you can undergo where you can sort of quotient out by any lack of injectivity of that map. You can form quotients in the category of topological spaces. Okay, I haven't verified that, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that that's true. Okay, so so that's one condition. So now we have. Uh, continuity, which is assumed, uh, sorry, which yeah, which is assumed for sigma. Uh, injectiveness has to be part of uh, uh, the condition if we're going to get any correspondence between these things, like this. Um, but then you also need the homeomorphism onto its image, so that means that um, it should be an open mapping onto its image. Okay, and now that's a, 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 a genuine topological condition. Um, there, so uh, for example, if the the controls set C is compact, this will be true, okay? Um, uh, if the uh, system is an affine system, okay, so uh, if f of x and u, so if c is a subset of rm, uh, and f of x and u looks like this, okay, then uh, this conclusion will be true there, okay? So for uh, lots of interesting classes of systems, actual real, real control systems, this will be true. Okay? But it definitely won't be true in general, and you cannot expect it to be true in general. Um, uh, you know, it's conceivable uh, that you lose information when you go from here to here. Um, uh, I'm, uh, you know, because of the fact that this does cover two very important cases, the control affine case, and then the case where the control set is compact. Okay? Um, and the problem, I'm, I'm, I'm certain there's other cases as well, all right? Um, so I'm, because it covers a lot of systems, I'm not so concerned about the fact that there may be systems sigma for which this isn't true. Um, uh, I don't know of any, okay? And my guess is they're kind of pathological, okay? Um, so, uh, so the fact is it's not always true, but uh, I, at this point in my life, I, I have to say, I don't care, and I moreover think it's not important. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what about iterating this map here? These maps here. You get a limiting topological control system, or oh, um, keep iterating this construction. Um, right. Uh, well, I think I, then we will get sigma two. Yeah. So, so that's right. So, um, I think I think it stops after one step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have to um, just because the map, the, the thing that goes from here to here is perfectly well, nicely behaved. So it will, it will go backwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it, that's right. So I think it just stops. Yeah. Okay. All right. Convergence. <laughs> Convergence of topological controls. No thanks. Not right now. Um, okay, so good. Uh, uh, I think that's everything that I uh, had wanted to say uh, from leftover from last time. All right, so let's talk about trajectories. Okay. Um, all right, so what we want to do is we want to talk about first of all trajectories in the, in the framework of topological control systems, and then you know as I say we have trajectories uh, for for these guys that we're all kind of familiar with, um, uh, and we'll consider the question uh, of of when there's a nice correspondence between those things. Okay, rather related to to this question here. Um, but um, you know, at the end of the day, so I'll have some results that I'll state. But at the end of the day, uh, um, I'm actually not so interested in that correspondence because I really want to work just with topological control systems because they seem to capture 
um, many, many interesting control systems already. Uh, uh, and then what we'll do is later on, we'll talk about a different kind of uh, notion of trajectory, uh, which is really more closely adapted to the topological framework. Okay. So there'll be kind of two notions of trajectory that I talk about. The one I talk about now will allow us to compare um, trajectories of this with trajectories of that. Okay. Um, and then there'll be a more general notion, which is actually the more interesting one. Okay. All right, so um, let me just <clears throat> jump right to it. system here. So what am I trying to generalize here? What I'm trying to general, or not generalize, but adapt, um, is the idea that if you prescribe u as a function of t, okay, then this thing turns into uh, a fixed time-varying vector field. Okay, so that's what I'm after here. And you, know, you normally call that, um, uh, just u prescribed as a function of t, you call that an open loop control. Okay, so that's, that's where this language comes from. <coughs> Um, T is an interval, U is an open subset, you know, because uh, I'm talking about topological control systems, you know, somehow open sets uh, uh, need to play a role here, okay? Um, I can't con just consider things that are globally defined, um, and it doesn't really cause uh, very many problems. Um, uh, and X here, <clears throat> Um, so I have this family of time-varying vector fields, and it has the obvious kind of definition. So it means that uh, 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 x, first of all, is one of these nice time-varying vector fields. Okay, and it additionally, of course, has the property that x of t um, is in f of u uh, for every t. Okay, so that's the notation I use for that. <coughs> All right, so that's an open loop system. Um, see that this does uh, uh, generalize to the topological control system framework, the usual notion of an open loop control. All right, so I have a normal control system. Okay, so whenever I write this down, I mean a control system in the sense that I talk about. Okay, so you remember the sense that I talk about means that this map has to be continuous. <laughs> So a control for a system like this, the, the, of the sort that we're going to talk about, um, uh, will be measurable. Okay, so pre-images of Borel sets will be Lebesgue measurable. Um, it will be bounded in the compact Bornology, so that means that for every uh, a bounded subinterval of T, 
there's going to be a uh, relatively compact subset of C in which the control takes its values almost everywhere. <clears throat> okay. Okay, then uh, we can define um, F mu. Okay, so F mu is going to be now a time varying vector field. sense. Okay. Okay, so then okay, um uh for every uh, u in M open okay, this triple oh sorry uh, F mu T U um, is, an, is an open loop system in that sense. <clears throat> okay, for um, which topological <laughs> control system? For the topological control system associated with sigma. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now you ask, can you have open loop systems for this? which do not arise in this way? Okay, that's a question we'll sort of get around to answering that. <clears throat> okay, now the only real assertion here um, is that F mu uh, <coughs> lies in here. Okay, And that is a consequence of the continuity of this map. Okay, So this is why um, uh, the, our definition of a control system is made so that this map is continuous because we have then assertions like that. Yes. Is that a question? Uh, no, I just forgot. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so um, another thing that we want to uh, capture in our uh, world. So here I have a, uh, a, a, a class of controls and without really any further assumptions on anything, uh, for, for a system sigma, the class of controls here is the set of you know, bounded locally, uh, sorry, measurable locally, locally essentially bounded uh, uh, controls. Okay, but you know, maybe um, you want to use uh, special classes of controls. Okay. And you know, the control also should depend on the initial state, right? Nope, nope. These are no. Nope. These are just completely open loop, prescribed solely as functions of t. Yeah, um, just everything, one hundred percent open loop. Yeah, no feedback or anything. No, like I mean, the initial state, no, no feedback, but the initial state. Yeah, no, no. There's yeah. I mean, um, you know, if you want the trajectory to be defined for a certain along, say, the entire interval t, then that will generally not be true. Okay, but that's a different question. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the, ve the definition of the vector field makes sense. The definition of the flow of that may not make sense. And, and in that sense, for an initial condition, there will be a class of controls. Okay. For an initial condition in a T, okay, there'll be a class of controls which uh, give rise to trajectories defined on that entire interval. So that will certainly be true. But at this point, I'm just talking about um, <coughs> dynamics, not flows. <clears throat> Okay, uh, right. So I want to um, systematically have a way of uh, restricting myself to talking about possibly uh, subclasses of controls, not just general, measurable, locally essentially bounded functions, but you know maybe you want to talk about piecewise constant functions or piecewise continuous functions, things like that. Okay. So we want to <clears throat> see how to do that in this. Uh, um, Topological control framework. language I'm going to use here is open loop subfamily. So the way to think about this is this is a family of open loop controls. Okay. Um, 
Okay? And so what it's going to do is it's going to place restrictions on where this vector field is going to live. Okay? You're going to have some sort of subset uh, uh, where that vector field is going to live. Okay? All right. Um, is an assignment <coughs> to every interval and uh, open set U <coughs> a subset. Okay, and the subset I'm going to write um, is G O L. So this will be an open loop family. Okay, um, and this is going to be I'll write it like this. Um, I don't know if I can't remember exactly the language I use, but I'll write it like that. Okay, <coughs> and so what this is going to uh, um, so this this will be just some prescription of a subset of this. <coughs> okay. And uh, uh, what attributes uh, should you have? All right. You should really have some kind of a, um, a restriction property here. Okay. And that's about all you can expect at this point. Okay. Such so that. If T1 is contained in T2, okay, so my time domain for one is contained in, in, in uh, for that for two. And similarly, if U1 is contained in U2, then okay, um, if I take an X, which is in the bigger one, okay, so it's going to be GOL of T2, T, uh, uh, U2, so I'll write that in a second, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrict that um, to T1 cross U1, okay, and I'm going to take all such vector fields where X goes over GOL of T2, U2, okay, so you see what I'm doing, I'm just taking the um, the collection of vector fields which are defined for the interval T2 and the open set U2 and restricting them to the smaller one. Um, you know, a, a pre sheaf kind of condition, right? <coughs> um, this should be in uh, G uh, O L T1 uh, T1. Okay. And so a restriction condition. Okay. So let's look at some <coughs> common things. Okay. Um, okay, so we have what I'll call the full open loop subfamily, and that's just, you know, um, Equality here. Okay. <clears throat> and so that's the biggest one. And so obviously that will have the restriction property. Oh, and I should say um, if these conditions don't hold, so either that's not true or that's not true, then I'm going to take. Uh, um, oh, no. Uh, um, Oh, sorry, sorry, never mind, never mind. Yeah, that, that's, not, that's not germane here. Okay, never mind. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, right, so this is the biggest open loop subfamily. You could also define okay, the essentially bounded open loop subfamily. So this would mean that you take this will be a common one. Okay, so rather than taking locally <coughs> integrable uh, families of vector fields, I take locally essentially bounded families of vector fields. Okay, so this is like L1 versus L infinity. Oh, sorry. Okay, then you could also, you know, kind of adapting uh, this. Um, take time-varying families of vector fields which uh, 
uh, locally, almost everywhere, take values in a compact set. So I'll say exactly what that means. So this is the x's in uh, um, L, I, gamma, nu, T, um, sorry, T, U, T, U, such that, okay, for every bounded um, T prime in T, there exists a compact like over there, K, okay. <clears throat> and then this compact set will be in the space of uh, C new vector fields. Okay. So the TU or the sections of TU? I mean, no, that. That. oh, this one? No, 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 what do I mean? I, this, I think it's right. I mean vector fields on U. Oh, oh, well, Jimmy, as opposed to F. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're right. These are, these are, these are. Yeah, I apologize. Um, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I meant. Uh, I don't know if that was your question. Yeah, yeah. These are the vector fields. That's right. The ones for the system. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. The sections of T U have been too large. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. All right, so, so yeah, so everything, yeah, thank you. So everything's okay here. Um, uh, compact, blah, 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 uh, such that um, uh, X of T uh, is in K for almost every um, T in T prime. Okay. All right, so that last one is rather analogous to this one. Okay. smooth or real analytic case, okay? And that's because the uh, uh, topologies for the spaces of vector fields in that case have the property, <coughs> the compact sets are exactly those sets that are closed and bounded. Okay. All right, um, and so you, so these are the only ones that I'm gonna actually make use of here. Um, you could, again, for example, talk about piecewise constant controls, okay? So that would mean, a piecewise constant control would mean <coughs> That if you take any bounded um, or maybe compact subinterval of t, uh, it will have a finite partition um, and uh, into subintervals uh, where the x is constant on each of those uh, subintervals. The usual notion of piecewise constant. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. And so uh, now we can kind of precisely ask a question. Um, and the question is uh, um, this. Uh, <coughs> okay, so um, uh, oh, um, I think I, I apologize. Um, uh, it, it's, it's okay, but I, I think I want to actually maybe use the same notation that I have, have been using. Um, I didn't reuse G for these. The notation that I used was um, that. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, so that's a script O. Okay, not a, not a G. Okay, so let me um, O G O. Uh, 
actually, I think, moreover, <coughs> I didn't use this. No, it's kind of redundant. Okay, sorry. I think I just <coughs> change my symbols. Nobody cares. <coughs> okay, so a question that you can ask is if you start with an actual control system, construct its topological control system, um, then um, what you will have is uh, the open loop systems for uh, the actual system will be in here. Okay. And so if I have um, uh, um, Actually, I think I think I can maybe write this um, correctly in symbols. Let, let me see if I can do that given the symbols that I've introduced so far. Okay, so I have f mu okay. restricted to u. Okay, so remember what mu is here. Mu is a uh, measurable, uh, locally absolutely bounded in the compact phonology uh, <coughs> function of time. Okay. And I'll use the symbols that. Okay, so this means exactly what I just said. These are the locally, um, uh, the measurable, uh, locally essentially bounded in the compact phonology functions of time. Okay, that's the notation I'll use for that. Not infinity. Um, infinity will mean bounded in the um, von Neumann phonology. So you need mapping to C. What is that C? C is the control set. Oh, control set. Right. So I have uh, sure one of these guys. <clears throat> okay, so this is going to be the set of open loop systems uh, corresponding to uh, the actual control system. I'm sorry, yeah, this is, uh, is the, well, I don't think they have two board knowledges on C. No, I didn't say that. Uh, so, you know, if where we see is in a locally convex space, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so we always have this. Okay, so let me get my language right. So it's O, G, sigma, CPT. Okay, that's always true. Okay, so um, uh, so we have this. Okay, when you we have the quality. And so I'm not going to answer that question right now because it'll sort of come up when we talk about trajectory correspondence. But the point is that right now, this this is a question that you can ask. So, so and that has to do with the fact that you're looking at L block compact for me. The the fact that this equality holds. You know that you have the inclusion. Has yeah, that's right. So sorry, the the, the, the inclusion holds. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, that's right. So you know. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, so in other words, the CPT here you know, matches the CPT right. there. Um, uh, um, and sometimes, if your control set has more structure, okay, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about that uh, actually right now, okay? Um, because there's a special kind of uh, control system where you can extend uh, this question um, to more general classes of control. Okay, so... Sorry, at a very naive level. Yeah. Is it related to the fact of the continuous image of the compact that is compact? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's um, that, that. So when we. That's right. So when we um, prove um, <coughs> that f mu is in here. Okay. Uh, so in other words, if you have an open loop control. Uh, substituted into your control system that you get a time varying vector field of this class. In fact, what we prove is that it's down here. Yeah. yeah. And it's exactly that fact here. <clears throat> yeah, so that, this isn't deep, yes, for sure. Um, okay, so let me talk about another kind of control system. Uh, just a special case of a uh, control system that we've talked about already. Okay, so a uh, new linear control system. Right, so this isn't going to be a linear system in the usual sense, of course, because who cares about those? 
All right, so this will be uh, uh, linear here will be, um, um, you know, uh, the linear maps here will be uh, into the space of vector fields. Okay. All right, so a linear control system is a, again, it's a triple. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, F and C, okay, but we, now we have more structures. Okay, so M is the manifold again. Alright, so C, okay, so C here I will ask that it be um, a subset of a locally convex space. Okay. And um, uh, F okay, is uh, the restriction to C of a linear map. of a continuous linear map. Uh, yes, okay. So this is what I'm gonna call a linear control system. All right, <clears throat> so examples. There's two main examples. Sorry, uh, the uh, number two, you have an inclusion. It's not a subspace condition necessarily. Absolutely not. So so said, yeah, for exactly the same reasons that f of u has no algebraic structure. Yeah. Uh, this f should be continuous, right? <coughs> um, L means continuous. Otherwise, I'd write hall on that. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> all right. Um, OK, so first of all, uh, we're going to take um, V here, our locally convex space, to be Rm plus 1. Okay, so I'm going to show you that a control affine system is a control linear system in the sense that I'm talking about. Okay, so this is uh, okay, so C uh, is going to be. Um, Okay, so I'm going to have a, uh, let's call it a, a C0. Um, uh, it's going to be a subset of Rm. Okay, so for our, so when, it all, when I get this all wrapped up, it'll, it'll all make sense. C0 is going to be the control space, control set for my affine system. Okay, so it'll all come out in the wash. <coughs> okay, so it's going to be. Um, <coughs> So my control set is going to be okay ones and u's that look like that. Okay, and then the map capital F. Okay. So F is going to take now a point in uh, M cross C and give me a point in T M. So it's going to take an M and a point in C. So a point in C looks like that, okay? Um, uh, and it's going to be um, lambda restricted to C and lambda <clears throat> is gonna be now a continuous linear map from Rn plus one into space of vector fields. And it's just going to be kind of the obvious thing, okay? So, Lambda of u uh, zero, u one, <coughs> u m is uh, u zero plus zero plus u a a. Okay, and these uh, f's, the little f's here, are, are of course um, c new vector fields. So this map is continuous because um, maps from finite dimensional spaces, uh, finite dimensional locally convex spaces are uh, always continuous. 
Okay. So that, that captures control affine systems uh, uh, in our um, classification of uh, linear control systems. So, so uh, just again. Yep. Uh, based on this definition, doesn't, could it possibly follow that every control system is a linear control system? Okay, well, let me just answer that question right now. Just, for example, you take the vector space generated by C and this one. Um, it's not going to be that. It's going to be a little bit different from that. But the question sort of has, uh, you know, there's you know, globally generated issues you have to deal with, right? So, you know, not generally, um, but... Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, yeah, let, me, let me do this and then you'll see exactly. What I'll, what I'll do <clears throat> is um, uh, show you how a globally generated topological control system gives rise to one of these. So a control system gives rise to a globally generated topological control system. And yeah, okay. Um, uh, so if system is simply uh, a set of globally defined vector fields. Okay, so this sits inside there. <clears throat> okay, and um, uh, F, G. Okay, so this is going to take now a, a point in M and a control Okay, so a control in this vector, uh, in the control set, is a uh, uh, is a vector field. Okay. <coughs> okay. That's the uh, control system. All right. So now this is a linear control system according to my definition. Okay. Why is that? Well, I need two things, right? I need the, for the control set to be a subset of a locally convex space, which it is. Okay, and then I need for um, uh, I apologize. Um, this isn't what I meant here. I don't mean actually capital F here. Um, I mean that map. So F hat is the map on vector fields. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, the map F hat here, what's the map F hat here? Little quiz? X? Yeah, the identity map. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I won't bother writing this down. Okay, so F hat is the identity map, which is certainly a continuous linear map. Okay, so yeah, every control system uh, uh, can be made into um, a linear control system in this way. You right. take the tautological control system associated with it, which will be globally generated, and then you, and so the correspondence between those, yeah. <laughs> so, but you have a way of going from arbitrary system to linear control system, uh, but now, you know, the control set becomes infinite dimensional, um, and, you know, the thing that, the question that you then have to ask is, is, is there any useful correspondence between those in the sense of trajectories? 
Yeah, so that's one of the things we're going to talk about. <coughs> but I was thinking of the more direct construction here. You start from a classical control system. You take for V the vector space generated by. In, in where? In where? The vector space is a subset of. Oh, the same. So basically, formal kind of construction of vector space yeah. generated by the control set. Yeah, and that, there'll be no topology there. Uh, well, okay. you can probably put a topology there, but whether it has any naturality no, I associated I agree, with it. Yeah. I was just wondering whether by you could find a local complex topology for that vector space. And then uh, construct your map, you know, lambda and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, the linear map. Uh, yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. And then, in that sense, what I'm saying is that maybe if that's possible, then every control system, classical, is trivially some AC new linear control system. And maybe if that's the case, maybe some more restriction in the definition is necessary. But again, that's. So, so I, 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 my guess is something like this. This will be the smallest one, right? So you'll get something much bigger by doing that. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, right. Uh, my guess is this will be the smallest one. Yeah, that's, that's I don't know. I'd have to work through it, but you know, somehow I would guess that that would, and, and you know, probably you could even have smallest in the sense of universal objects with arrows. Sure. And, yeah, yeah. <coughs> <clears throat> but I think no matter how you do this, um, the trajectory correspondence will be problematic. Yeah, <clears throat> it is here, uh, and I would imagine that it would be even more so there. Uh, um, and even apart from the ambiguity in how you would define the topology on this uh, um, this uh, free vector space. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right, so these are kind of the two interesting examples of controlled linear systems. And so then the question you can ask, very much related to uh, the question I asked for um, uh, general systems that aren't controlled linear, is, okay, um, uh, we have this, okay. Now, it makes sense to talk about that. Okay, whereas before I had compact up there, now I can talk about L1, because um, the controls take values in a locally convex space. Okay. And the inclusion that you always have then is um, uh, the, uh, this. And this, I don't know if I wrote this when I did the compact thing, but I certainly meant to write that. Okay, and then the question is, when do you have a, when do you have a quality? Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, okay. So now we've talked about open loop systems. Uh, we've talked about open loop subfamilies, restricting the class of controls that we deal with. Uh, now let's talk about trajectories. system is, it's a time uh, interval and an open set U, and then a locally integrally bounded uh, C nu vector field uh, um, on T U. Okay. It's just an integral. It's just some integral curve on uh, the entire time domain T, and uh, on uh, taking values in the open set U. Okay, 
and so and it's an integral curve, of course. Okay, so I will, so remember here, x really is a map like this, right? <laughs> So I will frequently write that so that I'm not writing that. That's ugly. <coughs> okay, that's the obvious definition, right? Um, uh, oh, sorry. the actual definition part of it. <coughs> okay. That's the thing I'm defining is an XTU trajectory. <coughs> okay. Um, and then of course, um, I, I think I don't need to refine this any. Uh, you, you can, um, you know, fix a um, an integral t and talk about trajectories uh, with time domain t and so you can fix it, various combinations of this triple. The only one I really care about is just basically removing t and u. So a, um, a uh, trajectory for g is just an trajectory for some x t and u. Okay. All right, so that's so that's a fairly obvious way to define uh, trajectories. Okay. And right, so so as, as I said at the beginning, what time is it by the way? Ten. Ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so as I said at the beginning of the lecture, we're going to come up with a different kind of trajectory, which is going to be much more flexible and, and actually much more well adapted to the topological <laughs> than this. But for what we're interested in right now, which is comparing trajectories for control systems and topological control systems, this is a this is a good definition. <clears throat> okay. All right. So. Just this is the example is really just by way of introducing notation. <clears throat> okay, so we have a control system, a C new control system in the usual way. Um, uh, um, <coughs> What are trajectories for um, for these guys? Okay, um, so they're going to be th the same kind of thing, right? So it's going to be a mapping from a, a, a locally absolutely continuous mapping from t into u for some <coughs> time domain t for some open set u, um, such that. system was controlled with. All right, so, not so, so notation that we're going to use, because um, I'm, I'm going to want to uh, succinct ways of uh, comparing these classes of trajectories. <clears throat> okay, so we have um,
And so if you have a tautological control system, we have um, some open loop subfamily. Remember, this just means some class of controls. So this could be uh, essentially bounded, essentially compact valued, piecewise constant. Okay, so you fix a subfamily, and then you could have trajectories, uh, which are going to be defined on the time domain t, taking values in u uh, corresponding to that open loop subfamily. That's the notation that I'm going to use for those. Okay, and then you have um, control system trajectories. The notation I'm going to use there. Okay, so it's going to be rather similar. Okay, um, so uh, um, trajectories here will correspond to um, uh, controls, which are uh, compact, uh, locally essentially compact value, locally essentially bounded in a relatively compact phonology. That's the notation I'm going to use for those. We'll also maybe want to talk about control linear systems. And when I talk about control linear systems, um, I'm not going to use special notation for this. Uh, uh, the trajectories will correspond to L1 uh, controls. Okay? So if I'm talking about a specifically control linear system, the controls here will be L1. If I'm not talking about specifically a linear control system, the trajectories will be in there. Okay? They'll take values in a compact subset of the control set. Okay? <coughs> <coughs> All right. So now we have some language to compare trajectories. Okay. So the important one of the important things here is if you start with a control system. Um, uh, when are its trajectories the same as the trajectories for the tautological control system associated to it? Okay. Um. Trajectories for the control system are always trajectories for this guy with the um, uh, compact value controls. Okay. So, from things we've already said um, about um, uh, uh, you know, basically um, F mu uh, is one of these um, um, compact, locally essentially bounded vector fields in the comp relatively compact chronology. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, going the other way becomes difficult. Okay? Because essentially uh, what you have um, is you um, uh, you have now the family of vector fields of that form. Okay. All right. So you're going to um, take a. Okay. So you're going to take some curve, which takes values in there. Okay. But that's going to get you. And take the integral curves of that. So you know the curve has to have the right properties. It should take values in uh, um, on bounded subsets in compact subsets of the space of C new vector fields. Okay. Um, okay. So um, that's going to get you when you find the integral curves of that vector field. That's going to get you something here. So what you have to do then is you have to find a control. Okay. Um, uh, so you have an x. T for every T, uh, you have to find a control. So this is uh, uh, F of okay. That's a selection theorem. That's a selection theorem. Correct. 
and we use two flavors of selection theorems here. <coughs> okay, so uh, if um, the map U goes to FU, okay, so this is now the map from the control space into the space of vector fields, okay? If this map is proper, um, is injective and proper, Okay, so proper means the pre-images of compact sets are compact. Okay, so the idea of a, of a proper map um, uh, should be that if um, uh, the if um, the image of something is going off to infinity, then it should have been going off to infinity in the pre-image. That's kind of how to think about what proper means. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so if it's injective and, and proper, then you have the opposite inclusion. Oh, sorry. So that's some kind of a measurable selection term here. And sorry for this, I guess the compactness there of this OG compact plays a key role. It right? varies absolutely essential. You need to find this to be compact. That, that, that's right, that's right. So for many, not many, but not all, okay, there, there are measurable selection theorems that are valid for non compact set value maps. Um, and I'll <coughs> use one right now. Okay, But for this result, um, uh, you need uh, uh, compactness plays a crucial role, absolutely. Because what will happen here um, uh, is that on any bounded subinterval, there will be a compact subset of the space of vector fields in which the control takes its values. So you essentially reduce yourself to a compact selection theorem. Yeah. <coughs> okay. All right, so that's one aspect of this that you would like to relax, okay? Another aspect of this that maybe you want to relax um, is that maybe you want to give conditions on F rather than on this map, which I had previously called F hat, okay? All right, so here's one, so there's, there's, there's so many selection theorems out there. Um, many of them can probably be used to give different versions of results like this, and I'm just giving you two that I was able to draw up. Okay. This one is particularly useful. Okay, if your control set is Susan, okay, so we have lots of examples of uh, cases where the control set is Susan um, because the spaces of vector fields are, are Susan. Okay. This is Susan and if F. Okay. Now I really mean F here. Um, so F is the map that goes from uh, M cross C into TM, okay? not this map. Okay? So this is a condition on F. If this map is proper, then, um, uh, um, then we have the right thing. So again, you can find different versions of this. Um, uh, this one's nice because it doesn't require uh, uh, the image uh, to be compact in the space of, uh, uh, pre-image of compact sets in the space of vector fields to be compact. So that's a, that's a kind of a stringent condition, especially for um, uh, cases where the bounded uh, and uh, closed and bounded and compact do not agree, like Bollock spaces. Okay. And so maybe um, I will uh, finish by just because while we're while we're here, and it seems stupid not to take a moment to do it. Um, let's look at the linear case. Okay. Okay. So if you have a linear control system. Then again, you have uh, 
Okay, the, the obvious inclusion, the easy one, going from trajectories of your control system to trajectories of the topological control system. Um, and so remember uh, that for a linear control, control system, <laughs> And C was a subset of a locally convex space, and F was the restriction to C of a continuous linear map. Okay, and so you have a sort of unsurprising uh, 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 condition here, um, which is that um, that linear map should be a homeomorphism onto its image. Okay, so this just defines lambda for me. Okay. Because I know that f is the restriction of a linear map, all right? So lambda is the thing I'm interested in. Um, so if that's true, uh, and if lambda is a homeomorphism onto this image, <coughs> okay, which is so there's no compactness involved here at all. Okay. So that means I can talk about things that aren't necessarily compact valued. Okay. Then I have that. Uh, um, okay. So this is the L1 vector fields. Okay. <clears throat> And using my rule, where if I'm talking about linear systems, the trajectories here correspond to the uh, L1 controls. That's what I mean. <coughs> okay. All right. So these are the trajectory correspondence results that you have. And um, so there's two important corollaries here. <laughs> following from one from one theorem, one from the other. So um, if um, C, the control set, is compact, <coughs> then we have trajectory correspondence. <coughs> okay, that follows from part two. Okay, and we have to have injectivity, but you would, okay, that, that kind of goes without saying. So, one question. So, yeah. therefore, that condition. Which which one are you talking about? The, the second one? one? Second one. Yeah. Do you really need lambda to be a homomorphism onto its image, or the restriction of lambda to C? Um, uh, it it I'd have to think, because. It doesn't matter those, if lambda the, goes outside of C, right? Yeah, or but I'm not sure that's enough. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, because. Um, you know, it's not, I mean, I don't think it's going to be the, I, I certainly know I need that. Or maybe our land are restricted to the smallest substance. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there may be something like that. I, I certainly do not mean to imply that that condition sure. is necessary. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> but it's enough to prove this, what I'm about to state. cases where you have a compact control set and when your system is control affine, um, then you have exact correspondence of the trajectories of a system and its topological control system. Okay. Sorry, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, so yeah. again, there, uh, so I guess that homomorphism basically, so you need that kind of bijection, let's say, yeah. onto its image, yeah. Sure. So that basically you can invert the vector field. Exactly. exactly. It's, it's a very right. simple theorem. That's basically the yes. Okay. Yes. 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 That's right. Yeah, this, this, this theorem is not simple to prove that that one is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, and so you know, there's lots of things that are interesting here. So you know, with uh, uh, with things that Rob has been doing, he's been talking about control sets that are bounded in a Banach space, right? So those will not be compact. Um, so it would be interesting to think about what you can say here in cases like that. Okay, um, so there's doubtless going to be corresponding results here uh, in that case, but I, I haven't thought about it yet. Okay, so that's everything I want to say about trajectory correspondence. Um, next time what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, 
um, transformations of tautological control systems. How you go from one tautological control system to another, um, and sort of showing that in uh, uh, you have a so if you have a transformation, this gives you a notion of equivalence. If the transformation is an isomorphism, and what we'll see is that isomorphisms of tautological control systems are very simple. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.